So I, you know, I sit on many panels on how to improve the situation for women in academics. And I have one message and it is like, you know, childcare on campus that, you know, doesn't end at 3 p.m. and takes sick kids. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Offspring, the podcast. The podcast where we talk about open science, careers in and out of academia, diversity in science, and all other matters, PhD. We're your hosts, Allison Lewis, a PhD student from the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden. And Sandra Fendler. I recently defended my PhD at the Max Planck Institute of Neurobiology in Munich. Today on the podcast, we're talking to Dr. Marla Feller, a neuroscientist from the University of Berkeley, and we'll be talking to her about her experience as a woman in science, about childcare, and in our next episode, we'll talk to her about imposter syndrome. Another interesting fact about Marla is her um, studies and how she started her scientific career, which is actually not in neuroscience, but in physics. So Marla studied and majored in physics at the University in Berkeley, and did even her PhD in experimental solid state physics, also at the University in Berkeley. And only after that, she transitioned to the neuroscientific field and did two postdocs in neuroscience labs. And from then on, she stayed in neuroscience. Marla, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. So uh, I am a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, which is a big public university um, in, in the state of California. And uh, my rec I'm, I'm a professor in the molecular and cell biology department. And uh, my research has to do with um, the retina. So my interests are in understanding neural circuits. And that's how sort of neurons get wired up together to perform computations and we're interested I mean we study the retina because that's a, a great place where we kind of understand the computations that need to be done we understand the stimulus that comes in which is just kind of our visual experience and um, and so we study uh, using physiological methods to understand how circuits are organized and how they arise during development did you notice a difference moving from physics to neuroscience because in general, biology tends to have more women in the field than physics. And I'm wondering if you've had a different experience. Yeah, quite a bit. I mean, I worked for Carla Schatz was the first woman I'd worked for. And she did a lot to re-socialize me just the way I kind of talk to people. So that was one thing. Uh, you, but I just want to know like what you mean by that. Was there something about being in the physics field that you feel changed the way you spoke and you needed to change it back when you joined a different field? <laughs> Yeah. What do you what do you mean by this? So physicists are incredibly so you know from the rest of the world's perspective rude. You know you will <laughs> yell at someone because they missed a factor of two in their derivation. What an idiot! And you learn um, to not take that personally because it's not because you know and one should not generalize and physicists also come in all sorts of personality types but they're not always the most socialized right so it's not that they're you're a bad person, right? You left out that factor of two. It's like, there is an inconsistency in front of me and I'm going to get upset. You know, like there's something that doesn't make <laughs> sense in front of me and it's upsetting. And I mean, I was that way. And, and I think that you develop a pretty thick skin. So when people are yelling at you about mm -hmm. your data or your experiment, it's not you, it's your data that they're yelling at. And, um, and you know, so it's, you don't take things personally. And I actually, I think that that was the case. And so I, um, when I went to Carla Schatz's lab, who is, you know, a very competitive, very serious scientist and really, really nice, you know, I kind of, I had no concept of that. <laughs> before that. And so, you know, so physicists will interrupt during talks a lot and saying what you're saying doesn't make sense. And, you know, and, and really kind of aggressive questioning, um, and I think I would say things like that, like what you're saying doesn't really make sense. I would say that to a graduate student and that graduate student, you know, male or female would break into tears and say, why do you hate me? And I, and I, <laughs> and I remember one graduate student saying that to me, saying, you know, why do you hate me? And I looked, I looked at her and said, I, I don't even 
no, I don't even think about you. I don't even know <laughs> you. And that of course made it much worse. Right? <laughs> but that was, oh. you know, that, that is who I was. Right. I, you know, I was like, you like, you know, this has nothing to do with, uh, because I just, that is just the world I grew up in. I mean, I had friends, I had my Frisbee friends and I was a nice person, right. In some <laughs> environment, but you know, the, it's just like, I, I really didn't know this graduate student and I didn't feel compelled to be empathetic or anything. And uh, boy, did I get a talking to from Carla. And that is like not how this lab operates. And, um, and I really learned something from that. Like, you know, it's a much nicer environment, a much more supportive environment, you know, to not be that way, to be a little bit more empathetic and, and friendly to people. But I really had to sort of, um, and I still, it still happens to me. I will still yell at my students' data and it's devastating to them to hear that. And I have to like check myself and say, this had nothing to do with you, right? This had to do with the fact that, you know, you're getting action potentials when you shouldn't be getting any. <laughs> this is not, things are not working the way that they should. And then I get a yell. So it's maybe, the, maybe this is why so many people for, with physics background come to neuroscience labs or join the neurobiology neurobio field, right? <laughs> this is what I wanted to know. Like, is this, uh, was the more supportive environment you felt you had, like something that made you want to stay in neuroscience? Because of course you did your degree in physics, you did a bit in neuroscience, you always could have gone back to physics. Was it purely you found neuroscience more interesting or was it the community? I yeah, no, I think it's, I found neuroscience more interesting. I mean, I think that I was much more intrigued by the questions and figuring out you know, stuff that happens like physiology and stuff that happens in the body. I found that much more interesting. I'm not quite sure. I mean, I would say the one thing that was different about the community is that in physics seminars, it is very common, particularly at that time, for people to speak to the experts in the room. And at that time during neuroscience, there weren't many experts in the room, right? And so everybody had to speak to a general audience, right? There, you know, there weren't that many neuroscience majors, there weren't that many, you know, so everybody came from someplace else. And so talks were much more accessible and actually, Carla Schatz was known for giving beautiful talk, you know, for learning, you know, for teaching. I learned from her how to make talks accessible. And I think that is um, something, I think that plus, you know, now years of teaching have really helped uh, um, make me more comfortable, right, in, in this field. I definitely could not go back to physics now. That would be hard. <laughs> I would say the big difference for me came actually when I moved from San Diego to Berkeley. So Berkeley, so I am now in a department, I think that's 30% women on the faculty. Um, and if you had asked me before I came, whether or not I had a, any issues in my professional career, like since I've been a professor that were based on this discrimination, I would, I would probably say no. And certainly I didn't feel like my colleagues at UCSD were in any way less supportive. I kind of have this control, right? My husband is in exactly the same position I am. And I never felt treated differently than him. Uh, for what it's worth, he's a terrible negotiator of salaries. and <laughs> so, so perhaps he's not a great, we were very underpaid, you know, because neither of us knew how to do that. But, um, the, uh, but then I came to a department that was 30% women and, um, and it really did change. And it, it took me, I'd say 10 years to explain how it changed. And now I can finally describe it. And I think the way it changed is, uh, I am, you know, so there are, so when you have 30% women in an apartment of like 90 people, women, um, you know, we have women older, younger, uh, members of the National Academy, people who are not, uh, um, people who are supportive of family, women who are supportive of families, people who are not, right? Like, you know, or not, I shouldn't say everyone's supportive of families, but, you know, who will hear a, I need to go to my kid's basketball game and not get angry and some who will get angry, right? So they're... There are, you know, there's just this whole range of personalities that are, and so therefore I feel like I can be myself, right? And I don't have to represent like the whole gender in the room, you know, so, and that, and I don't even think I realized I was doing that before. So I would be on an admissions committee meeting, say in San Diego, where there are a few women, and I would feel like when I would talk about some student that I was somehow being the female voice right in the room because there weren't that many of us and now I can just say what I think and not feel like I'm representing my entire gender every time 
I open my mouth. And that has been very liberating. I find it interesting that San Diego and Berkeley are actually quite close together, but in terms of representation in the faculty you've had, it sounds like pretty different experiences. Do you have any idea why there are more women in Berkeley than San Diego? I, I don't know. I think it's a great question. I mean, I do, you know, San Diego has worked very hard and they definitely have more women now than they did before, but it's still, I mean, Berkeley has a lot. So it's not just San Diego. It's like uh, Berkeley has a lot. There's a few departments that have a lot of women. Okay. And I think there must be a positive feedback. Like, do I want to go to this department where I want to, I'm one of two women, you know, th that might be fine. Or I can be in this department where that's not an issue. You said you moved back with a child. Was that something that factored into the decision when you move around? Because I know that it can be really hard to work as a scientist and raise a family. Was that something you had to consider for jobs or? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's hard everywhere. I mean, I would argue it's easier as a professor than, uh, um, as a lot of other careers. So I have a, a group of girlfriends that I actually, I played, I played ultimate Frisbee when I was in graduate school and I became very close with the group of women in that we were, I was teammates with, and they all went on to sort of professional. And when I look at sort of the challenges they went through having kids, I'm not exactly sure mine were any greater than, than theirs where they had a little bit, you know, there's more flexibility in being a professor than there is in a lot of these other careers. And so I, um, have a I have a comparison group <laughs> but it's very uh it's reassuring to hear that your experience was so positive being a parent as a scientist because I know it's talked a lot about how challenging it can be for for parents in general but also women in particular to start a family I know a lot of my colleagues talk about okay, well, when I finish the PhD, is that the right time to start a family? Or is it when I'm a postdoc, is it okay to take parental leave? Or should I do it when I'm a PI? Like, when will it feel like I have time? And probably never, right? Never yeah, the yeah, right time point. <laughs> never feel like you have time. But then of course, you always have time. So I mean, I think it is, it's really hard to be working and to have a kid, except of course, I mean, we're not really allowed to say this out loud, I think very often, unless of course, um, being a stay at home parent is not what you want to do. And you feel like you might go insane if you do that. And that was kind of how I felt, you know, with a, with a kind of screaming infant at home, you know, I, I was, I could not wait, right. To get back. And I know we're not allowed to say that. And I would just <laughs> say that, um, but you know, there are other parts when my son was older and, uh, I don't know, was playing basketball or was in a school play, you know, I could leave at two o'clock and go watch his game and I go to his play. And, and those are stuff I would never miss. Right. I, I like, I would, I would, you know, not miss those things, but I could miss the screaming infant part, right? Like that part I was, but all people are different when it comes, you know, to kids and what are the things they value and what they don't. And I think we have to stop sort of beating ourselves up uh, over that. And if you know you want to be home for every, you know, for that time, then uh, you're going to take time out of your career to do that. There's just so many hours in the day and that's a choice that you can make. And that's a perfectly legitimate choice. That was just not the choice, you know, I wanted to make. And so when I've had many people who've had babies in my lab and, you know, they'll say, I want to take six months off and I'll say, well, you might not want to take six months off. And they, and then they, and I realize that's a horrible thing to say, because they're like, of course I want to take six months off. And then, you know, they're home for a month. They're like, oh my God, can I come back? You know, and some <laughs> take six months off, and some are like, you know, I really need to come back and, and that's okay. Like it's, it's all, it's all okay. So there's those questions of like, when's the best time? I mean, there it's, the best time is when you have a supportive partner, you know, to do it, or you're in a, a supportive community to do it. You don't necessarily have to do it with a partner, you know, whatever is the time for you in your personal life. But if, if for whatever psychological reasons or economic reasons or whatever, it's okay. You know, like the time you should decide when the time mm -hmm. is right, I would say for you. And like in hindsight, it's easy to say that, you know, everything worked out and don't worry about it. It'll be fine. But at the time when you were thinking about it, did you worry about maybe taking parental leave affecting your career, your advancement or anything like that? I don't remember 
thinking that. I mean, I remember, yeah, I don't, I mean, but of course I must have, right? So maybe it's been too long. So, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't remember. So I think, you know, maybe I was think, you know, so we had senior faculty take both me and my husband aside and say that they were sorry that they had missed out on their kids growing up and that, that we shouldn't do that. Like these were like, you know, older men who took us aside and said this. And I think that there was just a little bit of a change, right? That is what's happening. And so now that was 20 years ago. I'd like to think it's gone even farther, right? That, that people get it. Like when you have most people get it when you have a family and will be supportive of it. Um, there definitely was a generation and there are still some individuals who are not, but I really like to think that they are on the way out. Yeah. I just thought that this is very um, encouraging what you're saying now that um, there's nothing specific to, to the scientific field that makes it even harder to become a mother than any other job that you're doing. And you're right also that it's probably a positive aspect that we have a lot of freedom when it comes to our time management and to when we work and where we work and so on. So this is probably a positive aspect of <laughs> the work we're doing and how we can um, combine that with family and so on. I, I do think there needs to be infrastructure though. And so I don't know how things are in, in Germany, but certainly my impression is not great, like not that supportive for um Uh, women who have kids. So, um, I mean, I think that's also changing, right? So mm -hmm. 20 years ago, it was really not supportive for women who had kids in Germany. And so, and my understanding now is there is still this kind of weird, like you can get help with childcare, um, but only depending on how much you want to work and you have to work a minimum, you know, it's not very flexible. I, I don't know too much about the details, but you definitely have to be in a place, in a country, in a community That yeah, will true. provide, I mean, you absolutely need support. You need childcare and you need, you know, you need people to help you. So which infrastructure did you have back then when you had your kid while working as a scientist? So how did you organize childcare in your case? Yeah, so we, our son was in um, childcare, you know, outside of our house mm -hmm. from a very young age. So, um, which we, I think, I think it was great for him. You know, I, I think it was a very good for his development. I think it was great. He uh, um, it worked out very well. So, but that, but we, you know, had a two income family and we could afford it, right? We spent a lot of money on it, but, you know, we could, we could pay for that. Because that's what I always hear about childcare in, in the US, especially that you can have it, but it's extremely expensive compared to Germany. I don't know. And then because you said it's hard in Germany, it really depends Like there's no, I would say no like national thing that it's the same everywhere. It really depends where you are, in which city, it, in, at which institution even. And um, so for example, in Munich, we have it at the Max Planck Institute, but then it depends for how old the kid is, when you can start it. So maybe it can be improved when it comes to flexibility, as you said. But um, yeah, I guess it really depends. But then for you, was it um, a childcare from the university or institution you were working at? Or oh, sorry, at which time no. point was it again? I forgot. Universities have been terrible. At least okay. the universities I've been associated with have been terrible. Like they'll have something, but it'll, you know, it'll have like 20 spots and they have, you know, I don't know, mm -hmm. thousands of faculty who need it. Okay. So it's, uh, um, it's really been bad. So no, we paid for, I think when he was very young, it was a woman in her home took in five babies you know and so and then after that it was like a um a facility that we would drop him off with mm -hmm. lots of kids um, okay. and that he did up through kindergarten and then when he was in school he would participate in after school programs in schools and so we didn't need that um quite as much and depending on your situation sometimes people will hire people to drive you know pick their kids up from school you know they're there uh so there's a lot of There are a lot of things. Um, the university has gotten better. Berkeley has gotten better in that they'll help um, when you have one of the difficult things is when you have a sick kid. So sick mm -hmm. kid child care is tough. And the university actually will pay for a certain number of hours a year for you to call on this one service that will send someone to your house to take care of your sick kid. And so there is um, there is some little inklings of support like that, which I think are great. 
That's really nice. Is that something specific that like is offered at Berkeley or the California system or is it a US wide thing? I think it's University of California. Yeah. So okay. all the all the schools that are part of the University of California. I don't know if the state in general does that, but it is a nice thing. But I mean the ideal thing would be to have childcare on campus, particularly when you have infants, like if you're breastfeeding, if there's a place you could walk to and like feed your child and then, you know, um go back to work, that would be ideal. And some companies have that, but I, and very few universities do. Do you think it's something like on the horizon, at least for say somewhere like the California system that already is having this opportunity when your kids are sick to have support? Do you think it's on the horizon in 10 years, 20 years, or not even <laughs> being to know? Okay. Yeah, I, see I you don't shaking understand. I've been, I, you know, I sit on many panels on how to improve the situation for women in academics. And I have one message and it is like, you know, childcare on campus that, you know, doesn't end at 3 p.m. and takes sick kids, right? It, and, you know, say, well, <laughs> what about mentorship and all that? I'm like, no, you know, I mean, mentorship is great. That's fine. We need child care, right? Like, I feel like that that is, um, and and what I get met, what I hear is, you know, it's hard. I mean, real estate on campuses is, you know, important. Insurance is really expensive in the U.S. Um, so, I mean, I think until... I don't know. And it just needs to somehow get into the public sphere that this is, you know, uh, a bur you know, the society should help take care of kids. I, I did a sabbatical in Paris and there, you know, from six months, you can drop off your, mm -hmm. your infant at school all day. You know, like wow. it's, that's just like, uh, and it's like a public school. And so it's really, maybe, maybe it's not six months, maybe it's a year, but it's in some incredibly young age. Um, I think it's quite it, young. Yeah, you're it right. It is very young. And so the expectation is that, you know, that this will be provided for by mm -hmm. the government. Um, but this is also such a cultural difference. I learned that, that I know, for instance, the difference from Germany to France, just because you talked about Paris now, is exactly that, that here in Germany, you're, you're a bad mother if you're giving your kid away when it's younger than a year old, for instance, whereas in France, this is completely normal. Um, so, and then, of course, with this cultural differences comes also a bit of a different system um, that is there to support women or parents in general. So that is interesting. And then maybe the US is something in between. I'm not sure, but. I think you said that perfectly. I mean, that's exactly it. It's all, it's cultural. And in Germany, I'm sorry to hear that that's still the case because certainly 20 years ago, that is exactly the case. So you were Maybe not old. anymore. So I exaggerated and I hope it's not that bad anymore, but. <laughs> It definitely, I guess 10 years ago, I mean, it was definitely, you are, you know, and in the U.S., I would have some people say, oh, it must be so hard for you, you know, to leave your kid in daycare. And I'm like, eh, you know, <laughs> like, I think he kind of likes it and I get to work, you know, and so, yeah, it's not that hard. Um, and, uh, and, and some people who will say, oh, that's great, you know, that you have daycare. So it, it, it is very mixed here. But again, I just feel like things are really you know, both men and women talk much more about, take much more responsibility for taking care of kids. And maybe this is my warped view of the world now that I live in Berkeley, but it, you know, it just feels <laughs> like it's a more shared burden and, um, and it's just all talked about much more openly. And so therefore you're not a bad parent, right. To be talking about your daycare needs. You know, no, totally care. not. Yeah, for sure. I took note of what you were saying about you know, even if you have childcare, you need to be back to pick your child up at three, which anyone I think who's been a scientist knows, like it can be totally unrealistic to maybe leave the lab at three. And if you're in a situation where both partners are scientists, I think this kind of underscores the importance of the university or the employer actually being involved in the childcare, because then the childcare offered can actually fit the job description of the employees. Right. Yeah, I agree. We'll keep fighting for it. I mean, it's been no, it's been so apparent during this. Um, I mean, I think there is, I, I don't want to belittle the difference about people who have kids who don't, because I would say it has been extremely challenging for women during this pandemic and during the shutdown. Mm -hmm. It has been devastating for, um, I think it's been very hard for parents who are home. It has been devastating for women who are home with their kids. I mean, it, and, uh, and so hopefully this is what I'm telling myself that what will rise out of these ashes is better support systems for, for that.
um, because Hopefully. it really laid bare that those issues. So I had the feeling now after talking to Marla that her personal take home message is really that child care is essential and child care, improving child care is the most important measure to improve the life of women or parents in general in uh, STEM, right? Yeah, I, I think one of the, one of the real things that having childcare on site can address because when we, when we have these initiatives to improve the lives of, of women or people in science, I think sometimes we lose sight of like what, what, what it's actually trying to do. And I think what childcare does is it just levels the playing field. A lot of the time in science, we talk about like, you know, the motherhood tax that if you're taking leave to be away from the lab, if you're not in the lab, you're not generating data and you need data to get your papers out. And that's how you advance your career. And so I know there's a lot of statistics about like how more men go on to become PIs after the postdoc than women. And so now, you know, if a woman does want to come back, she has the option to do so because if there's not childcare on site, like sometimes it like going through childbirth, like that's a, your body needs to recover from that. And then like, babies are not always cooperative with your own career goals. Like I know some infants don't want to bottle feed. And so if you need to breastfeed and you have some, and you have something on site, that's suddenly an opportunity that you have now that you didn't before. Now, I think one issue that this doesn't solve is, you know, the women who actually don't want to make use of on-site childcare and they want to be at home with their children. How can we reduce the motherhood, the so-called motherhood tax for these women? Because I don't think that, you know, wanting to be a parent and spend time with your children should be this thing where you feel like you have to choose between your career and being a parent. I, w I want to live in a world where that's not a choice families have to make, scientists have to make. That's our show. Thanks for joining us and to our guest, Marla Feller. Join us again next week when we continue talking to Marla, this time about imposter syndrome. This episode of the Offspring podcast was produced by Allison Lewis and Sandra Fendel, with editing by Adrian Lahola Chomiak and Allison Lewis. Music was composed by Srinath Ramkumar and Gustavo Carrizo. Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net Science Communication Working Group and the Offspring Magazine. Bye.